You know, the other thing that I would think about is what about women? How do we think about the utilization of oral? Uh, I mean, women use oral estradiol all the time. They've used oral birth control. Where are we at with understanding testosterone for women? Sure. So I think it's 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 a super interesting area. Uh, if you think about it right, and and not to make this a male versus female, but you go into you know you go into a pharmacy and you you're a male, you have like thirty options <laughs> to go and pick up pick pick your choice. <laughs> what do you want for testosterone? Right. Um, if you go for the females, there is not a single FDA approved female testosterone. Crazy. Zero. Right. And and that's that's just an injustice, right? Right. Uh, But, you know, I think for the female side, what's happened since WHI too, is that providers and and people in this space have really understood how important testosterone is in a female body. And actually testosterone premenopausal is at, you know, I think it's 10, 20, 30 times the amount of estrogen in a body. Mm -hmm. So it is a female hormone. It's, I think we have to get past this notion that it's just a male hormone. It is a female hormone, critical. And again, if testosterone affects depression in men or cognitive function, if it affects insulin sensitivity in men, if it affects bone health, muscle mass, uh, tau proteins, whatever you want to you know, put out there in that sense, it has to have similar ramifications for the female. And I think what's happened is that because of guidelines, it's been pigeonholed into a sexual dysfunction issue. Yeah. Right? And that's not- Hyposexual. So it's um, typically used for hyposexual desire right. disorder. But what about, you know, again, the female that's, that's, you know, 50 years old that has, you know, oste- uh, you know early onset of osteoporosis, right? What, yeah. That, what, what about them? We know this is important in bone health. So again, total preface that this needs to be studied specifically in these populations. But I think what, what we need to see honestly, is a, is a thought process shift in the sense that females have testosterone deficiency as well. Full stop. It's not, uh, it's not again, a sexual dysfunction. It's not just one you know, area of indication. We need to understand that they have this deficiency and we should understand that it, it, it likely should be treated. And, and we can get into, obviously, we can do the work to say, okay, these are the ranges, at least to give guidelines to practitioners and so forth. But let's, let's not put this into a small, small bucket. And then could Kaisatrex be used off-label for women? Yeah, we don't obviously have an indication for it. So I can't can't recommend that. We are supporting research in this space. So we have investigators that have come to us and said, hey, look, we want to work on a female uh, study. And we think these are the appropriate doses. And and they've also gone to the FDA and said, hey, look, yeah. we, these, this is what we want to do. I mean, we use, and I and I speak for many of uh, the providers listening and many of the, the people listening that are women, I'm sure many of them are taking testosterone, which would be considered off-label um, for low libido or even having low levels of testosterone. But I, I do think that if there is a way to mimic um, the natural circadian rhythm in men, we should also be offering at some point for women. Um, you know, is something like this, if a provider was looking to offer it to women, is that something that you think will be available? So from, right, as, as we discussed earlier, right, like providers have 100% clinical discretion in, in what they do, right? So there is, there, you know, they, they wanted to take Kaisertrex at, at 100 milligrams QD once mm-hmm. a day and, and do that. That's, that's totally their discretion. Um, I think you're going to see, you know, there's this massive menopause movement, I call it, right? Which is just, uh, you know, fabulous physicians that have gone out there and been really vocal around this space. And I think they understand and they talk about how important testosterone is, right? So female, I mean, anecdotally, um, I won't. I won't describe exactly how she's related in some <laughs> sense, but but you know, I had a I had a colleague, let's call it, call me and say, "Hey, look, I just got on a, I got back from a girls weekend, six of them." She's like, five of six of us are on testosterone." And I'm like, "Wow, that's just that's that's in some sense it's amazing, yeah. right? Because you feel better." Yes. Yes. Like that's what you're telling me. Yes. And and so I think it's it's our job providers and investigators. And then frankly, I think going, going back to that nonprofit that I mentioned. Tell me about um, this nonprofit. What is it gonna do for people? Sure, so it's called the Testosterone Project, right? The Testosterone- I'm assuming it's about testosterone. It's <laughs> all about testosterone, absolutely. Um, but we have three main missions, right? The first one is testosterone testing. 
let's make this standard. Uh, this should be, I mean, frankly, the, the US Preventive Task Force should say you should be measuring testosterone because that's what's good in preventive task force, right? Would it be free total? Have you guys thought about that? I, ideally, I so, and we, I'd love to talk about free testosterone, right? Because as a concept, that's really what we need to be talking about because that's all that matters and all that you can use in your body. So I, I think it, it, it should be free. I mean, ideally we look at total T, we look at free T, we look at SHBG and, and I'll definitely get into that as yeah, well. Yeah, because I'm curious, does SHBG go down with oral. So uniquely, SHBG drops by, by in our phase three studies, SHBG dropped by 30%. Wow. In some of the abstracts that we're seeing published, this can range up to 50%. 